Rising from the flat, arid plains of the West Texas Permian Basin is a true jewel of the desert, a center of commerce, industry, and arts, where a rare breed of Texans mine the earth and shoot for the stars. Tall buildings rise into a seemingly endless sky within an ever-growing city whose fascinating history is as engaging and full of adventures as the people who call it home today. It's the home of presidents, has produced movie stars and racing legends, and is home to a thriving oil and gas industry. Join us now as we share the stories of the past and look to the future of one of the most unique cities in America. Midland, Texas, an oasis on the Badlands. The story of Midland, Texas begins in 1849 with an expedition by U.S. Army Captain Randolph B. Marcy to find a suitable route for a railroad spanning the 850-mile distance between Fort Smith, Arkansas and Santa Fe, New Mexico. Marcy's route mirrored the route of another famous explorer many years before him, Don Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, who documented and named the primary geographical feature of the area an immense rising plateau, thousands of square miles in area, which he named the Llano Estacado. Back then, the Llano Estacado was an arid, windy expanse of rolling treeless country where no permanent civilization had yet to thrive. Only grazing animals such as the great American bison, something Coronado had never seen before, called it home. The Llano Estacado's gigantic, flat, traversable plain lured both Coronado's and later Marcy's expedition along basically the same route through the area. In September 1849, Marcy and his men reached the area that is now Midland, Martin, and Glasscock counties, stopping at a small spring to water their horses and pack animals. Marcy noted many bison and wild Mustang horses in the area surrounding the spring and in his diaries named it Mustang Pond. A few days later, he and his men came upon an even larger spring further to the east, which Marcy subsequently named the Big Spring, and today the town of Big Spring, Texas bears Marcy's moniker. Marcy's expedition to find the rail route was a success, even by Marcy's high standards. In his diary, he wrote, The creator of the universe has made this the perfect place to build a railroad. We shall not have to dig a single tunnel. And he was right. An historical marker at modern-day Mustang Pond, now a dry basin called Mustang Spring, commemorates Marcy's expedition. Marcy's writings and field guides were sought-after literature amongst his peers, including his books containing advice on successfully dealing with and building stable relations with Native American tribes. It was knowledge that not all were privy to, however, and a group of Texas Rangers would learn a hard lesson about underestimating the Comanches in a showdown that began with a hail of gunfire near Mustang Spring. The last Texas Ranger ever to be killed by a Comanche died with his boots on just north of Midland near what is today Andrews, Texas. Ranger W.B. Anglin, a 29-year-old lawman originally from Virginia, served in Company B, Frontier Battalion. The battle between Anglin's group of Rangers, led by Captain James Peak, and a runaway Comanche raiding party led by Black Horse began near the headwaters of the North Concho River in the summer of 1879. The ranger detachment stumbled upon the runaway Comanches, who, Peake wrote, fought like cornered wildcats and stood off the rangers until nightfall. As the fight went on, the Comanches managed to steal several of the rangers' pack mules, which were loaded with ammunition and supplies. This act signified a huge embarrassment for the rangers, who tracked the Comanches west the next day across Mustang Pond and into an area near a large playa lake in what is today Southern Andrews County. Spotting their pack animals on a hill near the playa, Captain Peake sent Anglin in to investigate. But as he neared a buffalo wallow in the edge of the playa, one of Black Horse's warriors rose up from behind it and shot him to death. Not knowing how many Comanches they were facing, Peake and the remaining rangers were forced to withdraw and leave Anglin's corpse behind. The next day, Company D of the 10th Battalion found and buried Anglin's body somewhere near the playa. Today, we remember W.B. Anglin with a Texas historical marker at Midland's Fairview Cemetery. 
The marker says of Anglin, he was buried on the spot where he fell and that he was known for his bravery, kindness, good humor, and unceasing devotion to duty. I saw, I saw the light from heaven shining all around. I saw the light come shining. I saw the light come down. In 1881, the Texas and Pacific Railroad at last hooked up between El Paso and Dallas in an area that would one day become the modern city Midlanders now call home. A single rail car, much like this one, was rolled off the tracks to be used as the post office of Midway Station at Midway, Texas. Unfortunately, the name Midway was already taken by a Texas town, so Midway became Midland, and from that single rail car, a city was born. Echoing the words of Randolph Marcy, the TNP at first referred to Midland as a dry, lonely spot on the prairie. But as the railroad spread and the TNP Land Department began recruiting settlers to Midland, the TNP changed their opinion of the area, calling it a great place to live in their marketing and sales materials. TNP flyers and posters used phrases like pleasant climate, no fertilizing required, cheap homes, and low taxes in an effort to lure people into the area. It worked, and when the town map was laid out, it looked like this. As can be seen on the map, Midland was originally part of Tom Green County until 1885, when it was named the seat of the newly created Midland County. The corner of Wall and Main was originally called the corner of Iowa and Abilene. In fact, all of the north-south streets in Midland were originally named from east to west for the stops that the TNP Railroad made. Marienfeld, which was the original name of Stanton, Big Spring, Colorado for Colorado City, and so on all the way to Dallas Street. Since that time, downtown has gone through a lot of changes. Main Street and Wall was, and continues to be, a very important part of downtown Midland. In the late 1800s, it was home to the famed Lano Hotel, which was delivered to Midland on a flatbed rail car. In this photo, a group of cowboys pose in front of the Lano on horseback for a Christmas Day photograph in 1888. And this is the second Lano Hotel, bigger than the original and constructed of sturdy brick and mortar. This is Wall and Main on July 4th, 1908. An Independence Day parade travels past the Lano Hotel as part of the day's celebrations. It would be the last parade the hotel would see, however, because in April of the following year, the street looked like this. The worst fire to that point in Midland history broke out inside the Lano, completely destroying it and many other buildings along the street, including the First National Bank building. This disaster became the catalyst for the formation of the Midland Fire Department, which until then had not existed. The story of the Lano Hotel doesn't end in charred rubble, however. The very next year, the third Lano Hotel was built. It later became the Crawford Hotel, and an additional floor was eventually added. It was later covered in brick, and in its last incarnation, looked like this. Today, the Midland Center sits on the spot where the Lano and Crawford Hotels once stood, continuing the tradition of keeping downtown busy with events and interaction whenever possible. The First National Bank was rebuilt after the fire too, and after reconstruction appeared like this. This building still exists today, although the Greek columns and pediment have been removed. Today, it looks like this, still a part of downtown Midland. The spirits of antiquity know well the rich past of this humble intersection in the middle of downtown. So the next time you find yourself at the corner of Wall and Main, take a moment to stop and have a look. History is all around you. Midland's first train depot was located at the corner of Front and Main Streets in this now empty strip of land just south of the tracks. It was constructed primarily of red sandstone that was brought to Midland from quarries near Barstow, Texas. 
Midland's second train depot was constructed just across the street from the old depot on the east side of Maine. Today, all that remains of the structure is the lower retaining wall, which is still located alongside the tracks just across from the Midland County Jail. Midland's first courthouse was this wood frame design and was located on the same spot where today's courthouse sits. It was also the scene of Midland's only hanging in 1890. Like Midland's first train depot and many other local buildings of the time, Courthouse No. 2 was constructed of red sandstone blocks from Barstow, Texas. It was eventually torn down to make way for the third courthouse in 1930, and in an event that made Ripley's Believe It or Not, the blocks were sold to a private citizen for one dollar. The stipulation for the sale was that he would move the sandstone from the premises himself, which he did, using the blocks to construct houses north of downtown. Today, some of the original sandstone blocks still survive at one of the houses located on Colorado Street. Now condemned and covered in peeling white paint, the sandstone peeks through its deteriorating whitewash as if yearning to tell its story. And while several attempts have been made to acquire the blocks and return them to the public square, they have unfortunately been unsuccessful to date. To this day, Midland County has continued the tradition of keeping its courthouse in the public square. The location that is today Midland's Almer Park was once the site of the original Midland College. Midland Christian College operated from 1910 until 1921. Students of the institution could catch a horse-drawn bus at Main and Wall, which would then transport the young scholars one and a half miles down College Avenue and deliver them to the campus for study. In 1917, the two-year college boasted a total enrollment of 250, but was forced to close a few years later due to financial difficulties. Today at Ulmer Park, we remember Midland Christian College with this historical marker. The three-story school building may be gone, but Midland's legacy of two-year undergraduate education continues at modern-day Midland College on the city's north side. Midland continues to evolve and change with the times. These aerial photos show how the downtown skyline has changed over the years and how the city continues to grow. Fueled on by a 21st century oil boom and an ever-widening industrial and commercial economic base, Midland is becoming bigger and more diverse every day. To this end, several buildings in central downtown, including the historic Permian Building, are being raised to make room for new development. The Permian Building met the wrecking ball in the spring of 2007. Other buildings slated for demolition in 2007 include the Midland Savings Building and First National Bank Building. But these certainly aren't the first buildings ever raised in downtown. One of the most famous building demolitions in Midland history is one that didn't exactly go to plan. The historic Scarborough Hotel was a West Texas mecca for businessmen and dignitaries from the world over, including the likes of Harry S. Truman, who stayed at the hotel in 1939. The building itself was set to be demolished via dynamite implosion in 1973, and the demo crew was warned by the city's old-timers that the building was very sturdy and might need a little more than the standard amount explosive bang. Ignoring the warnings, the demo crew proceeded with the project as planned. So, on a windy morning, with most of the town on hand to witness the event, the explosive charges blew, shrouding everyone and everything to the north of the hotel in a thick cloud of dust. Expecting to see a pile of rubble as the cloud cleared, everyone was astounded to see that the hotel was still standing in place, a little worse for wear, but not demolished. Subsequent to the botched implosion, it took wrecking ball operators several weeks to destroy the building. And every time the wrecking ball hit the hotel and the structure didn't fall, the crowd cheered for the building. Perhaps this story is indicative of the unique pioneer spirit Midlanders share. Tough, resilient, strong, not easily brought down. That spirit is evident throughout the history of Midland, though the city has certainly changed. Midland Memorial's West Campus was once the chief drive-in theater. Part of the historic Yucca Theater was once an appliance store. The Western United Life Building, as it appears today, 
and as it appeared while undergoing an addition decades ago. Downtown Midland was once the location of the Ritz Theater. What is today the Midland County Corrections Facility was once Woolworth & Company. The tower building as it appears today and as it appeared when it was being constructed. Today at A Street and Missouri was once the Triangle Food Market. The Petroleum Building as it appears today and as it appeared when part of it was Texas Electric Service Company. The Plaza on Wall next to the Bank Building was once the Mobile Building with its trademark Pegasus Horse atop its roof. Midland's population has increased tenfold since 1948. The Mid-America Building was once the location of North Elementary School. The Marathon Building was at one time the site of the Yakel Hotel, which later became the famed Haley Hotel. Downtown Wall Street as it appears today, and as it appeared in 1927. And across from the Midland Federal Building was once the Midland Garage. The Little & Company building was originally Midland's first Masonic Lodge, built in 1909. Those who call it home know that Midland is a place like no other. Many years have passed since that single rail car was pushed off the tracks of the TNP to mark Midland's location. And since then, a tough, headstrong, tenacious people have turned Midland into a bustling modern city of the West Texas desert, where only the sky is the limit. And with each day, Midlanders continue to build their history, working to ensure a rich legacy and bright future for their oasis on the Badlands.